Hello, 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 everybody. How y'all doing? Yeah, yeah. Everybody good? Everybody good? Everybody good? Everybody can hear me, sorta, maybe, kinda, a little bit. Yeah, somebody's talking. It's me. It's me. Hey, I want to welcome everybody to the what is what is it? July? Yeah, the July instance of PMG's AI Evolution Meetup here in Austin, Texas. Uh, PMG is your host. You're 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 in the offices right now. My name is Brent. I work here. I am the director of AI. Hey man, um, I'm the director of AI here, and what we're trying to do, and fairly successfully, is kind of establish ourselves as a kind of a technology, establish ourselves with a technology presence here in Austin. We're headquartered up in Dallas. We do these these same sorts of things up in Dallas as well. We've been doing the meetups for eh, almost a year now, I believe. PMG is a digital marketing agency. What that means is pretty much at any given time, a quarter of all of the ads out on the internet are have kind of come through PMG. It's about a quarter of them and stuff like that. So if you're really annoyed with ads, then you're annoyed with us. Um, but you know, as we all know, ads have probably paid most of our salaries for the last couple of decades. And, and, and that's kind of the way it works. We are uh, the agency. What that means is sometimes we act as agency of record for some of the bigger brands. You can kind of see some of the ads that we've got on these pillars here. Nike's one of our one of our clients. We manage their North America digital marketing budget, and we're starting to punch up into their television budget as well. You can imagine that that's probably it's Nike. It's probably a lot of money. Um, we also do things like programmatic, so we're like. Um, search engine optimization, search engine man or search engine management, those sorts of things as well. We have a creative arm, so we actually will do a lot of the creative parts of the ads with with some of our with some of our clients and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Driving a lot of that is some of our internal technology, and that internal technology is kind of. Some folks here at PMG will say we're, we're a fake marketing agency. We're really a technology company. Um, I don't know if I, I would go that far. We definitely are a, tech, a marketing agency, but we actually have a pretty strong technology arm. And being in the ad space, there's a lot of data associated with that. And that data, the only way we can get our hands on that these days is, of course, through machine learning. Um, and because we're also doing a lot of creative stuff, there's a lot of interesting stuff that we're doing internally with Gen AI, right? So that's that's what we're doing here. What we're, you know, full full transparency. One of the reasons why PMG is doing this is because we are hiring, and we're we're hoping to inspire people to come and at least you know knock on our door and talk to us about some of the opportunities we have. My, you know, we've we've got. I don't think we have anybody from the marketing team here, but my email address, not the marketing team, the talent, the talent acquisition team. Um, my email address is bs at pmg.com. That's pretty easy to remember. Um, it turns out to be pretty accurate as well. And so, if if you're interested, you know, just send send an email to that, and and you'll remember that one and stuff like that. We're gonna we're gonna kick off tonight. Um, we originally scheduled three speakers one of them could not make it this is a live event sometimes that that happens and so we're only going to have two what that means the benefit for all of us is you know the speakers can can you know expand out their their talk tracks a little bit we can engage with them but we can also engage with each other um, much much more deeply we'll have a lot more time to network and and talk to each other etc cetera, etc cetera. Can I get a show of hands for whom this is the very first time they've come here? That's a that's a great that's a great first time um, first time um, out outcome. I appreciate that. That's that's really cool for the folks who have been here, right? Um, you first timers, we're actually attracting repeat perform, re repeat attendees, um, and so we we want to keep that happening. One of the ways we keep that happening to keep the momentum going is. We always have an open call for speakers. And so if you want, if you've got a story to tell, 
somewhere in software engineering, somewhere in AI, somewhere in machine learning, you know, those kinds of spaces. We want to hear those stories. We want to give you guys a platform to tell those stories. So again, reach out to us. We have an intake form and I can get you all of that and, and we can make that happen and, you know, give you guys a platform to, you know, tell us how neat you are. Speaking of neat, the very first person that we're going to be that's going to be speaking tonight is Jason Hartley. He's a PMG employee. He is our head of media trust and in media innovation and trust. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about ethics um, in both AI and expanding that a little bit. So everybody, here's Jason. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, we have been doing this a long time. That's why. You know, I'm sort of down the list, so you're getting the dregs of the PMG uh, players. Just kidding, of course. Um, it is an honor to be here. So great, thank you. So it is an honor to be here. I'm really glad uh, to be asked to to do this. We I was in Dallas a couple of days ago, so that was the first time that I've talked about this in public. Um, so that was my dry run. So this is going to be much much better. Um, and also, y'all are a much better looking, more interesting crowd, and it's, it's exciting to talk to you. Um, so I want to talk to you about ethics in, in the AI era, but I think it was really important. As I, as I was preparing for this and as I've been really delving into these topics for the last eight years or so, a lot of what is out there is abstract or huge or impossible to think about or to wrap your mind around it's such a big topic and when we you know when we think about the scale of what we're working on it's really hard for our brains to wrap you know to 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 understand what we're what we're dealing with and we can't really use sort of accepted philosophies because they don't necessarily apply um, so we have to think about it in a in a much more dynamic way because it's moving so fast and the implications are so big um, so that's why I really want to emphasize that it's personal because we all have to have our own sort of take on this. We don't have Aristotle talking to us about how you deal with this. You know, there are new things and we have to sort of think about our, our own values. And then how do we challenge our own values so that we can have a wider sense of, you know, purpose in what we're doing. Um, and then finally, also practical, because if you do this for a living, there are a lot of times where you have to say, well, you know, how do I make the right choice here? You know, my job might depend on this decision. And those are all valid things to be thinking about. So as, I think if you create your own sort of personal set of ethics about what you're doing, um, it could, it can really actually free you up to make better decisions. And I think that if you are thinking about this as, as a job and you're thinking about PMG or wherever, the ethics, again, it doesn't have to stop you. And actually, when you have a clearer North Star, sometimes that can make you feel more creative and allow you to do things because you know where your zone is and you work there. And sometimes you have to step outside of it. That's just the nature of things. That's the world we live in. Not everything is black and white. And that's why it's so important to really engage with this topic and think about it deeply. At the very end of this, I will have some links for a lot of the resources that I've used and I'll discuss here. Um, but obviously throughout, if you have questions, please stop me. If you have an opinion, my opinion is one, I'm just here standing here and I was lucky enough to do that, but everyone's opinions here are valid. If you're working in AI, you're connected to a very large universe. And as we know, it is connected. So decisions that we make can affect a much larger swath of the population or the world, um, than ever before. So I think it's really important to talk about this. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here to, to listen. So I am head of media innovation and trust um, at PMG. I was, um, my specialization for 20 years or so was paid search. So I was running Google ads. Um, that's where I started to work with a lot of machine learning. And then as neural nets started to be the thing that, that came up. And so I was working in it, but I'm not a coder. I'm not an engineer, but I've been working deeply with, the, with um, partners who do. People like Brent, I can go and say, do I have this right? What do you think? How should I how should I you know think about this and how can I communicate this to people who don't have a Brent in their life? So um, so for the last twenty years, I have been in the digital marketing industry. After before that, being uh, a dancer, a musician, and a writer, so I was in a completely different world. So when I got into digital marketing, when my wife was pregnant with our first child, and I was like, oh no, I should you know those three things that I listed before don't pay very well. I don't know if you know this, but uh, this job does. Uh, so I could raise my children, make sure they uh, are fed. But this, so the, really the last 25 years, or the first 25 years of digital marketing, the scenario was a little bit like this. And if you can't see, I'll just walk you through. So 
we had this mindset that consumers are defined by their data trail, right? So when I started, big data was just starting to take off as, as this concept. And it was like, okay, we have more data than we've ever had before. What mysteries are we going to unlock with all this? And how much more data can we get? What is it going to tell us? How can it make, help us make better decisions? And so that created this cycle where people were really focused on data collection. And we got really, really good at that. And that made us really value the data that we had. So we prioritized what could easily be measured. And this created this cycle where we just kept creating skill sets, where we were just keeping this going and keeping this going. And we actually did really well. I mean, we made it was a revolution in, in the way we were working. And it was all very interesting until we got to a point where we realized that we had forgotten the person behind the data, right? And this was something that's calamitous in our world, we're trying to do marketing and we are trying to track people in this surveillance sort of world so that we can sell them khakis, right? So it wasn't as stark as that, but it kind of was, right? We weren't thinking so much that all those data points were somebody trying to do something and probably unaware that we had that data. And as someone who had had a, an artistic background and coming into this field, I felt like wow, this data, it, it's a, it covers, you know, it's a CYA for me, but it also is really, I didn't even question it. I was so excited to be able to get into this and to get answers to my questions and to be able to point to the data and say, I'm doing this because this tells me so. Not long after I, you know, after the bomb went off and as we were thinking about this and you started to see headlines on the, on the, on the, uh, head, on the cover of the New York Times talking about what I did for a living in ways that were really unflattering. There were leaks, there was Cambridge Analytica, there were all of these things that were just this awareness that all this data was being gathered and no one was really watching. So no one was minding the store and no one was thinking all along, the question was always, can we do this and not should we do this? And so I lived that for the last 20 years or so. In the last several years, we have had to have some repercussions because of that behavior. So we have 75% of the world's population has some legislation that covers privacy now. And so I would venture to say that you know a little bit about this, but the legislation in our field is usually behind and unwieldy and difficult for businesses and stifles innovation because it's very difficult to keep up with us. We have trouble keeping up with ourselves. So if we're asking politicians who have to go through these very difficult uh, processes to be able to pass these laws to make everybody happy, it really just, you know, it, it, it's not a good way to do things, right? So we do have to think to ourselves, you know, what role did we play in this? You know, especially for me, because I was in it for 20 years and I was doing these things that led to those this, to, to these, these new laws. And the perception of what we do as being something that was really not so great, right? So this is where we are now when we think of our, this is what I want you to think about as we think about where we are with AI. And what I'm really glad about though, is that, while in those early 20, the, the early part of the 20 years that I've been doing this, no one was really asking those questions. Now everybody really seems to be asking these questions. They're saying, is this the right thing to do? Should we do this? And there's more awareness in, uh, among the population. So we're not doing it under cover of darkness. And we do sort of understand that there's a greater obligation here. But it's unclear what we do with that information, right? Even if we're thinking about it, what do we do? It is such a big thing and it is so complicated. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So we're just going to look at where we are with AI, where I'm sure a lot of y'all are, are going to be good there, but I'll sort of frame it in this, in this, uh, the questions of AI and ethics. And then sort of how to develop your own personal ethics. I'm sure you've done that in certain ways and some people are going to be you know, are very introspective and thinking about this all the time. Some people just sort of kind of go by their gut and we all have a sense of this is a line I don't want to cross. And hopefully you don't ever get to that point, but you may. Um, and then finally, how do you apply those ethics in the everyday? You know, if you're fortunate enough to work in this field as I am, you know, I do have to apply that. And I'll talk to you a little bit about um, the way we handle sustainability here. All right. So assessing the state of AI. So this is sort of the way people talk about, or they were talking about generative AI when it came out. So this is Sundar Pichai, who's the Google CEO. And he says that AI is the most profound technology humanity is working on, more profound than fire or electricity, which, you know, typical understatement in this era of like, this is the type of thing that we're confronted with. And while it's a little bit silly, 
it's not that silly, you know, and it is something that we do have to take seriously. And so when we talk about something that could on one pole cure cancer and on the other pole in the world, you know, that w where do we fit? What, what kinds of decisions do we need to make? How do, how do we stop that, that train and get the train in that track and so on, when probably what we're just trying to do is get data from one place to another to make a better decision. So you've probably seen this before. Um, it's a little bit overdone. The, the with great power comes great responsibility. I think we've, we've seen this so many times and, we, and it seems so intuitively correct that we don't question it. And I see it referred to a lot in the AI world. And it is true, but it's, it's not enough because what happens is, is people start to evaluate this and sort of say, well, do you, do you have the power or do you have the power? Which one of us has the responsibility? And it's not usually clear. And usually they're pointing at Mark Zuckerberg or someone like that. But ultimately, we really have to think about where we stand in this power and responsibility world. So I have helpfully plotted all of these Spider-Man characters uh, on this responsibility and power plot here. Um, and you can see, yes, indeed, Spider-Man is up here. And by the way, ChatGPT did spit this out. I said, this is what I want you to do. And there it was. So that saved me a few hours uh, of total wasted time, obviously, because this is ridiculous. But so we have this, right? And we have... Poor Mary Jane down here. She has no power, no responsibility. She's just Spider-Man's girlfriend. Um, but she's more than that to, to all of us, I'm sure. But then there's Aunt May, who has no power, but a lot of responsibility, because she's trying to influence Peter. And really, in the scheme of things, most of us live here, right? And so we have to sort of figure out what it is. We don't have a lot of power. And we may not have a lot of responsibility, but most of us kind of live here. So I think it's helpful to do that just because you say, well, all right, well, where, you know, what is my role and what I need to do? You're somewhere in between probably Mary Jane, Gwen Stacy, and Aunt May. And that helps you make decisions uh, if you look at it that way, if you're like me, which you probably are not. But at any rate, you have great responsibility no matter how much power you have. This is the point, right? This, you, you may not have any power, but you do have that responsibility. And the responsibility might just be to yourself. Because when we act unethically, one of the victims is ourselves. And this is something that's really an interesting concept when you read some of these philosophers. But it is true. I think that you know if you're doing something that runs afoul of your beliefs, you don't get a lot of joy in it. You may have gotten a promotion, but you're not going to get joy from that promotion. You know, and so doing things the right way are good. That's something that's good for you as well, as well as being good for others. But most of us are going to have an influence more than just one person, right? Not more than just ourselves, especially in this field. Again, it's so connected and so big. So with that in mind, we, Aunt Mays and uh, Kirsten Dunst of the world, we have to sort of figure out some frameworks. And luckily, there are a lot of them out there that you can review for yourselves. Um, this is the fair information practice principles, and this is something that the privacy community works on a lot. So I deal a lot with uh, data privacy, um, so I have to know, you know, what's going on GD GDPR in Europe, how are they thinking about data, why are they thinking about this way, w what are the new laws going to happen in America? We don't have a federal approach to data privacy. We have a bunch of different states who have a bunch of different rules um, based on their constituents, and that's neither right nor wrong. It just that's the way it is, and so I have to stay on top of that. And one of the things that you have to do is to say, okay, well, it looks like the direction of travel on privacy is going to be X. And the way to do that is to think about, well, what are the fundamentals of this? And so fair information practice principles are something that guide all this legislation. But it's also a good guide for as you start to think to yourself, you know, what do I think is the right thing to do? And so some of the topics that you have here in these F FIPPs are collection limitation. So that's really a great rule if you're thinking about privacy. A lot of people in the privacy world say, you can't misuse data that you don't have, right? And that's a great rule. But if you know anything about large language models, which I'm sure you all do, that's the opposite of what we do, right? We gather as much information as we possibly can. So it doesn't necessarily apply, but we can think about it and we can think about that dichotomy and, and how do we navigate it and how we might make better decisions. Another one is use limitation, which basically says, all right, I'm only going to get the data that I need, and I'm only going to use it for a specific task. Again, the exact opposite of what we see with large language models, which the promise of it is, is that it's very flexible, and it can be so many different things, and we don't know what it's going to be. And to say that it has to be these things is just going to take away the power of it, right? 
So, and then there's individual part particip participation. Can somebody say, this is not the right data. I want to be involved in this. I want to say yes. I want to say no. I want to con consent. Again, we're all lost in those large language models and our little trail, you know, it's, you can't find us. So there are a lot of things that are very helpful in one sense that give you this framework, but it doesn't really work here. So you have to look further and you have to look at a bunch of different attitudes in different fields and ask yourself a lot of questions because there are questions that we have to work through. So in my world, personalization versus privacy, I'm trying to deliver you advertising or content that's actually going to mean something to you that might actually be useful. I don't want to spam you with things that you don't care about. I want to give you something that's actually you might be interested in. Maybe. And but I also if I have to track you 24 hours a day without telling you, it's probably not the right thing to do. That's probably not a good trade off. Unless I'm selling you uh, mesothelioma uh, ads or something like that. If you if you're if you're a lawyer and you get you know fifty thousand dollars or a million dollars or whatever it is, that's probably okay. But anyway, so these other things they did to think about autonomy versus safety, um, bias versus fairness. This is a huge thing. The bias versus fairness when we think about this, and there's some counterintuitive things that I've 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 found. And I'll share that with you in a little bit. But you know these things they're. All of these things feel like, well, yeah, this is the good thing and this is the bad thing, but it rarely works that way. So what you have to do is you have to explore these topics and think about them and be introspective and work through these things. And again, this isn't about arriving at the answer no, right? It isn't about no, I shouldn't do it. It's about saying I'm going to take an act intentionally based on information that I've gathered so that I, I'm, you know, I've actually challenged my assumptions. And then you make that decision, you feel better about it. And it's usually a better decision as well. So here's an example of one of those counterintuitive issues. So a few years back, there was a study done. There's a paper that you can get online, but it's our LLMs weird. And by weird, it was Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And what they found was, is that this is another plot, not as interesting as the Spider-Man universe, but nevertheless useful. We have cultural distance from the United States Correlation between GPT and humans. And you can imagine that's the United States, right? So we are the dominant player in all of these, all the data that was gathered, every, all of your decision that was made along the way sort of favored Americans, right? And probably American men more than women. So up here. So the answer is, of course, well, gosh, we need greater representation in the data, you know, because we have people who have not been participating. 20% of Americans live in, in a rural uh, area but they are very under, uh, under uh, represented in the data because they're not engaging with digital tools the way we are. The exception is chemicals and water use because all the chemical companies and, and the, um, the farming uh, industry are tracking that sort of stuff. So at any rate, so this is clearly a problem where we could have bias and so on, but I recently saw this uh, article called The Representation Paradox, and it was saying, Yes, there is a problem with the fact that we're not represented. However, that representation could be weaponized. We don't want necessarily our data to be out there. And that's populations within our country and around the world, because data can be used in bad ways. So there is this, well, gosh, do we really want to be represented? You know, we, we talked about you can't misuse data that you don't have. So you can't abuse this data for, for populations that maybe aren't as protected as well. Um, from stereotyping and that sort of thing, profiling. But at the same time, you don't want to leave people out. So these are really complex questions. And they're never obvious. So again, I just encourage you to use as many sources as you can as you reflect on these topics. And as you do that, you can just sort of say, well, there are all these different topics, fairness, transparency, human dignity, privacy, there's job displacement, there's all of these different topics. And you could choose five of them and that would be great. You know, you could choose one or two of them, but if you can just think about those and say, these are the things that are really important to me. You know, you can, it could be as simple as, if I see somebody spouting off on social media, something that I know is misinformation, I'm gonna say that's misinformation. Or if I see something that looks really interesting, but I'm not really quite sure if it's true, not sharing it. There are just little things that you can do. So if misinformation is, is the thing that you're most uh, worried about, you can participate in that way. But ultimately, we can't worry about everything. We can't do everything perfectly. We can't get everything right. 
So we just try to say, all right, here are the five things that I really want to try to focus on. And hopefully that will be a good guide for you. And, th and it's up to you for what those things are. And they're all valid as long as you've done your research and you've sort of, and again, you've challenged yourself. But the nice thing is, is that there are a lot of resources out there. And this, there's going to be links at the end of this that you can look at. But so we have the IEEE -E -E with general principles of ethical AI, but there's Future of Privacy Forum where they've done an incredible amount of work thinking about privacy, uh, thinking about uh, AI ethics. The, the intelligence community is thinking about it. Uh, the uh, art, AIartist.org, they're thinking a lot about it. We have the ANA, which is something I'm a member of, talking about different uh, best practices, UNESCO, and on and on and on. So there's a lot of different points of view here because it, it, you know, it impacts so many different people. So unlike what we've, what I did in the first 20 years, there just weren't a lot of different points of view that you could look to that it emerged as people started to have opinions. But for now you can really go out there. So if you spent 10, 10 minutes a day, you know, as you sort of sat down and had a cup of coffee and read about something like this and just looked up and just followed your interests, then I think that you would find that that could be very helpful in making you feel better about what you're doing. Are there any questions? Since we have some extra time, I'm happy to pause and answer any questions. Yes. No, not really. I mean, what it was was, I'm just trying to show like there's this broad based, you know, you can get all sorts of opinions from various people. And ultimately, as you're as you're looking at them, the, the things that I use to to judge do am, am I do I think this is a valid point? I try to think about what is the ideology of this person or organization. I tend to prefer one that has very little ideology, right? Uh, what is their knowledge of this topic? You know, because you see people on LinkedIn talking about all this stuff, and you look at it, it's like who who are they to even have an opinion? They should just be sitting back and listening. You know, like they, they clearly don't know what they're talking about. So those people, you know, and then there's creativity. Because it's very easy to say, well, they say it's wrong, so I guess we can't do it. It's much better if you're saying, okay, well, I see the limitations, and I think that there's better ways to do it, and I'm going to use my creativity to do it. So there's sort of like, if, if you, and you kind of get a sense, you know, do they know what they're talking about? Do they have an agenda? And are they stopping at the easy? You know, and, and that's what I've been trying to do. And so even if they were completely wrong, if this is the totally wrong source, you're getting that point of view. And so when you make your own decisions, you've, you've factored that in, right? So if you just ignore it because it's the wrong organization, probably not the best thing to do. But if you cast your net a little bit more broadly, you're going to catch some interesting things. If for nothing else to say, okay, now I know, and they're wrong, and I know this, and that's fine. Anything else before we move on? Yes. When it comes to third party data brokers, they're not going to comply with it. And these companies buy data all the time. Yeah. Yes. And <clears throat> they hey, are. Jason, yeah. can you repeat? Oh, sorry. Yes. So the question is so we know that the larger companies are going to have to comply with the regulations, uh, legislation, and all that because they, have, they want to stay in business. They're in the crosshairs. The FTC is going to come for them or, or whatever it may be, or the, in the, the e EU Commission. So, but there are data brokers who kind of work in the, in the cover of darkness and they gather all the data and they buy data from this company and this company and they kind of put it all together in this one place and nobody knows that they exist. So they don't have an incentive to act in an ethical way, right? They're just here to make a buck and they don't really care and they don't want, they don't care if they're accountable and they're not thinking about any of those things. And that's absolutely true. Those companies are absolutely in the crosshairs of every regulator out there. You can never, I mean, in this industry, it's so vast. Some people are going to get away with this stuff. You know, it's, it's not perfect. But I will say that there, uh, California has passed a law that lets you globally opt out of all data brokers. And they all have to honor that. And if you don't, you can get sued. And that's the thing about California is they let their citizens sue the companies for better or worse, you know, obviously you can have frivolous lawsuits and that can be stifling of innovation and all that. Again, there's always another side of this. And for data brokers, the interesting thing is if you just say, okay, well, data brokers are bad because they, get, they put all this data in here, they disempower everybody, they don't, we don't know that they have our data and so on. That is true and they do need to stop doing these things, but they're also how 
you get your identity back if your identity is stolen. It's also how nonprofits find people to do their um, to do fundraising. So if people just start disappearing, then it there are some downstream effects that actually affect people who are trying to do good and virtuous things or helpful things for, for people. So you're absolutely right. Like that's one of the areas where, I mean, it's a really ugly industry and, and people are trying to clamp down on it. I think there's more awareness of it and that's the start. And then the laws get smarter and then they'll probably move on to something else, you know, but for now the incentives are there to, for data brokers to do that for sure. But we don't have to be a part of that. So that's the thing. I'm not going to be, if someone, if a data broker company came to me and they were a bad company and they said, do you want to come work for me at twice the salary? The answer is no. Right. And so that's, that's one little thing we can do. All right. That's a great question. Thank you. So very much on the topic. So applying those ethics. So when I was talking to Brandon about this topic, um, he said, well, you know, this crowd is going to want some technical solutions. And, you know, and the good thing is, is like a lot of this stuff actually is codable. You can put these things in, you know, machines and they can do some of the work for you. And we can automate some of this work. And so, and again, these, there's links to these all, but there's this trusted AI uh, resource on GitHub. There is uh, Verify ML. This is another thing where you can, they have a long list of different technologies that'll help you look for bias and all the various things. I gave you that list of things you could be worried about. You can apply that list of things that you're worried about and have them and have it help you spot those things in some process that you're trying to develop or you're being asked to build or maintain. IBM's research uh, trusted AI, this AI Fairness 360 is pretty intriguing. There's a lot of chatter about that. Um, I can't say for myself that it's going to do everything perfectly, but it definitely is something that people really feel good about um, in the community. And you can see it's got the Python docs and, and the R code and all that kind of stuff. And it does help you do these things in a way they're automated. And then Google has something as well that you can get to. Um, same deal. It's all just a way to make this stuff practical and something that you don't have to spend weeks and weeks and weeks trying to figure this out. As long as you know what to tell it and what you're looking for, then you can have these tools and they're going to help you make better decisions. You might know what I'm going to say next, which is that tools can only get you so far, right? You have to use your own judgment as well. You do have to know what you're looking for, what to ask, how it works, how to evaluate it and so on. And then we have to then just be thinking, you know, what is the purpose and impact of this? What are the downstream effects of this that I'm not thinking about? You know, one of the things that we're wired to do as human beings is to care about people who are closest to us and who are like us, you know? We're gonna save our neighbor from, you know, what uh, my, if my neighbor is going hungry, I'm gonna bring them food. But if someone in Australia is hungry, I don't care, right? I just, I can't care about 8 billion people. And so that's the sort of heuristic that's implanted into our, our, our DNA or our brains. But when we think about something like this, we have to think about the people who aren't like us. We have to think about everyone who might be affected. And the people who you tend to not think about are the, probably the ones you should be forcing yourself to think about more. Again, not to stop you from making decisions or not doing the thing going forward, but just making it a better thing, you know? And maybe you can use that creativity and knowledge that you have to get a better outcome for people who may have been left out or harmed by the decisions that you made because you weren't thinking about them. And it wasn't because you're bad. It's because you're human, right? And that's the thing. But we're also, as humans, we can be curious, um, just as curious about learning these things as you would about all the code and all the things that you've spent your life learning. So if you add in, in, into that and say that this part is just as important as the coding and the technical part, then I think that you'll find that you'll develop these senses for yourself as you've, you've uh, developed the skills that you have. All right, so... A real world example. So I've kind of told you about my background <clears throat> and sort of my feeling of regret that when I got into this field that I was really, you know, I just bought hook line, hook line and sinker. I wasn't questioning things. I was just like, yes, more data equals better. You know, always more, more data equals better until I sort of realized, well, no, that's not really the case and started to embrace a more ethical way of doing marketing and the way of uh, doing digital marketing in particular and then how we handled data, and then how we talked about it, and then how I was a manager, and how I would talk to people who were new to their careers, and so on, and trying to be a force for someone to just to say, just stop and think about these things first. You may still do it, but just stop and think about it first. So when generative AI came, came screaming on the headlines, and we were all excited about it, 
I was jumping up and down, making the same mistake I always make, which is I'm too excited about this. And I was talking to our executive team and they're like, whoa, 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 we, you know, we'll get to this. But right now we want to do the right thing. We need to evaluate this. We want to do it the right way. We want it to be secure. We want to make sure we have governance in place. And so I was a part of the governance team. So that was, that was really, um, you know, eventually I'll learn this lesson. I'm 53, maybe when I'm 60 or 70, I'll be able to uh, hold my horses next time. I won't be involved, I'm sure. I'm going to be kicked out long, long before then. But so one of the things that was very clear when Gen, Gen, Gen AI started to take off was that um, there was a there was a, a consequence to the environment. Um, and so in my role, I'm sort of in the on the spider graph spider graph uh, area. I'm Peter's boss, right? The owner of the or the uh, editor of the newspaper because he does have a lot of power. He's spreading information. A lot of people look up to him. He has a lot of people that, that work for him and so on. And so this is the, the position I found myself in when thinking about, okay, well, these large language models, there's a problem. <clears throat> they use a lot of power, a lot of power. And, you know, I was sitting there thinking, okay, well, our company has a stated goal of, you know, sustainability being a priority. And we had numbers that we were trying to hit. And then this came along and I was like, hmm. Well, how does that how does that affect all of that? Have we just thrown that by the wayside because this is too big of an opportunity? And I will give credit very much to our executive team because I can go to them and say, "What gives? You know, what are we going to do? Are we going to are we going are we just going to set this aside because it's too important for us as a business to think about the goals that we had set out for ourselves?" And the answer was no. They said, "Yes, absolutely. We have a team that is." responsible for us trying to hit those um, goals environmentally and, and, you know, in terms of our emissions. So I was like, okay, great. And I talked to that team and we put together a presentation as we rolled out licenses to everybody on, in our company and our company is about a thousand people now. So we're giving out a thousand people, these licenses to use chat GPT, however they wish with obviously some, you know, it's an enterprise model. So we're, we're not allowed to use a lot of things and all that. So it's, it's safe but people can use it however they want, basically. And so I shared with everybody as we, the day, you know, before we handed out these licenses or maybe the next day, training a model like GPT-3 can use basically the equivalent of annual energy consumption of 120 American homes. So 120 homes in America to train one model. And as you know, there are lots and lots of models out there. Um, and so energy is the problem, unless you're an energy company, in which case, you know, it's, it's, it's good times. Um, so I also shared this. So we, uh, part, part, you know, Brent, Brent mentioned that we're, we're not really a fake marketing company. We are in certain ways, but because, not because we're bad, but because tech is our focus and, and marketing just happens to be what we do. But search is something, paid search is something we do a lot of. And almost everybody in the company is highly aware of search, not to mention everybody in the world is familiar with what it is to Google something, right? So it made a lot of sense when I saw this article that basically says, on average, a typical Google search uses 0.3 watt hours of electricity versus 2.9 watt hours using a chat GPT request. So this was something that I could very, you know, put in people's, you know, it's tangible, right? Just say like, think about this. The next time you press that button, it's, it's what, 10 times more energy than if you do a Google search. So it wasn't to say, don't use chat GPT. It was just remember this, you know, think about this, use it wisely. And then I also said, the good news is, is that we have a lot of solutions that we're working on as an industry and outside. So there are a lot of things that we're doing. We're realizing we can do great things with smaller models. We can use a lot of, you know, AI can help us with energy consumption as a whole and make things that are, you know, more uh, efficient using this technology that we're building and so on. And there's a lot of, you know, it's MIT. And it, you know, again, you want to look, you're trying to find neutral sources here to like show like, okay, well, this is not someone pushing an agenda, you know, and so they're in Johns Hopkins, you know, Johns Hopkins is probably not going to be like the number one AI pusher. Uh, and, and so they were talking about more generative, fewer generators, designing energy efficient AI. So basically the point was, look, everybody, this isn't a doom and gloom story. This is something you can, you can feel okay about, but we do still have this responsibility, right? So again, I'm one small person. I'm making my decisions one day. This is one of my favorite Onion articles of all time. It was from 2010. I've never forgotten it. It says, how bad for the environment, how bad for the environment can throwing away one plastic bottle be 
30 million people wonder. <clears throat> so at this, and the article goes on to say, all of these people are saying, oh, well, you know, the trash can's right there. I'd have to walk down the street for the recycling bin. And, and it's basically 12 million people ask, thinking the same thing at the same time. So collectively, yes, it does matter. Um, and so this resonated with me. I still think about it 14 years later, so maybe we'll hear as well. Uh, but the point is, it did, you know, everyone has their role to play, and they could easily say, well, it's not that big of a deal. I'm just one person. Things are getting better. The, it really is training the model that uses all the energy and so on. But it's not really true, and you can play a part. And so we gave everybody, and we built it out more than this. There's a lot of specifics, but just basically avoid frequent redundant queries. Don't use AI for simple tasks, which goes for all of us. You know, when, when this came out, it was like, well, what can AI do here? When, could we use AI for that and all that? I think we're starting to pull back and say, actually, you know, the good old way, you know, the good old fashioned way of doing this works just as well or better or whatever it is. Let's not just use AI as the hammer looking for a nail. Let's think about the problems that we have. Does AI help us solve them? If so, let's try that out. But it's not just a default action. Scheduling tasks for the interaction. So maybe we're using it in low power times. Um, streamlining use in general so that we're not, um, you know, just doing things throughout the day and not really having a plan. It's just being about being more intentional. So, and then when you learn all these things, you share them with your teammates, right? So we, as a company, we share a lot across the company. So if I have some great new thing, it's like, oh gosh, I figured out if I, if I did it this way, it's going to save me 15 pings of chat GPT. So very small, but you know, it, it's something that's, that's not nothing. And by the way, chat GPT did um, announce today search GPT, which is, a new uh, search engine that they are prototyping. So is it gonna be better than Google? Is it gonna be worth that? Of course, Google now has Gemini, so, and that's powering search engine uh, results as well. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. All right, so wrapping up, everyone has a role in promoting the ethical use of AI. And, and that can be things in small in the way that you act, it can be the way that you talk to the community. If somebody reports to you, how are you modeling your behavior? And not, not just modeling your behavior with AI, but everywhere. If you're cutting corners in one area, expect the people around you to, to see that and say, well, I'm gonna cut corners wherever it may be convenient. And it may be in places that really make a difference. Your beliefs will be stronger if you challenge them. They'll also be more broadly representative of different points of view. Um, going with your gut is great, but you wanna have an informed gut uh, as much as you can. And there are a lot of tools that can inform your gut, you know, so just go out there and find them, spend a little bit of time reading them. I think you're going to find it really compelling and interesting. Um, they're very difficult problems to solve. And I think people who are drawn to this sort of technology are problem solvers at, at heart. Um, and so it, it, it goes for the ethical questions as well. So I promised you links. So these are resources for thinking, you know, to be thinking about all the various options. And these are tools for doing, right? So the thinking, this was all of the various things that I was able to find. And uh, there's a, an amazing essay here by uh, this guy, Andy Matuzik, I believe is how you pronounce his name. It is an incredible essay. I really highly recommend it because he talks about all the different faiths and philosophies and how he thinks about it. He helped develop iOS. He was uh, a partner on Khan Academy. He's a legit guy, and now he's talking about the things that I'm talking about. And you're going to think I plagiarized him, but I just found it today, and it's like so perfectly what I wanted to say, but so much, so much better. Uh, you know, he, he phrased it so much better and, and, and eloquently, so I recommend it. And then these tools are the tools that I told you about, and these will unlock many other tools because a lot of them are a list of tools, and then you can evaluate those and see, you know, what works for you. All right. And that is all I have for tonight, but I'd love to answer questions if you have some. Thank you. All right, we got a mic for you and everything. <clears throat> Precisely in the part of tools, I had to work in um, ethical AI in 2021 after Tim Midgebre was, was fired from Google and it triggered the wave of uh, ethical AI. And after several months working with some of these tools, what I realized is that the tools that I was using for a source of truth were indeed biased. So the one who had to tell me what's biased were indeed biased. So you, you made the point, use the tools, but your judgment is needed. And I would say, yes, of, I mean, it, it's very needed because it, it, there are several things are very subjective. Right. And even the people who are putting a standpoint there, it's still an opinion. So you cannot escape, but but I saw in, in, the, comp in the team that I was working on it, I was seeing that, just because Microsoft says something 
because Microsoft is Microsoft, people say, okay, then if Microsoft says it, right. we will stick to it. Is that no, they, it's a still an opinion just because it's Microsoft or Google or OpenAI saying that doesn't mean that that's ethical in absolute terms. Absolutely. And, and there, it's a great point. And I don't think there are absolute terms in this world. I mean, and that's part of the issue in this essay that I told you about. Like one of the things is that we're dealing with a world that is moving faster than our ability to apply old models to it. And so there are some foundational practices we can have though, to your point is valuing judgment and making sure that we are using that judgment when we're applying these tools. I mean, one thing is for sure, I might be able to play around with ChatGPT and get some good information out of it, but a data scientist using it is gonna get a lot better information from it or say it's impossible to get the information. And so that evaluation goes for also ethical choices as well, for sure. Any other questions? Yes. Everybody using it? At the company? So I would say like most people or in most parts of the world, you get it and it's like, oh my gosh, what can I do? And you play around with it and you see, and then it's like, well, it didn't give, it didn't solve all my problems. He asked how we use chat GPT as a company and, and, and it was a lot of usage and then it fell off. Right. But that's kind of what happens. Right. But then you have people who, who are saying, okay, well, that was an interesting failure. What can I do to maybe deal with that failure? Um, and so you iterate on these things and the people who are out there doing that then come back to the team and say, oh, by the way, I used this to create this thing. And everyone's looking at it and they're like, hmm, you know, that's, that's interesting. I think it's better in the way, because if someone is someone who just kind of like uses it and then gives up, you probably don't want them using up the energy, right? You want people who are actually kind of going toward a, a destination, but we have teams that are working together. We have what we call tiger teams all who gather around like our social marketing team is using a lot for workflow things, you know, and, and like most companies we're finding that it was harder to bring it into the company than, than you might expect because it isn't a tool, you know, it's not just a tool or it's not like a Microsoft package. It's just something that you layer on. And so, you know, Brent talks about it being, you know, there's a, a line between automation and augmentation and bringing augmentation in doesn't feel as satisfying as, you know, okay, I, I've, you know, we re we're replacing discrete tasks rather than whole jobs, you know, and that may be for the better, but the point is, is like, it's let people get less excited about that. Cause like doing something that wasn't very fun in the first place and being able to do it twice as fast, that's not as exciting as, you know, all the things that are in our dreams. But at any rate, so I would say it's widely used by in each department, probably there's that, you know, like everything else, 20% of the people are making 80% of their progress. The other 80% 80 of the people are kind of waiting to see what is going to happen and some are contributing, but I'd say that's probably a fair bet. And there's, there's data around it. I don't have it. You might, but, um, but that, that's kind of how it is. Um, when people hit some friction, some people stop, some people say, I've learned, I've seen enough. I, I want to go far. I want, I'll go forward. And that's kind of what we've, we've seen. And then, of course, there's our AI engineers who were, we hired them to do that, so they don't have any choice. Oh, oh please. Back off that, are you guys starting to work on AI agent and assistant development inside of that framework? Yes, uh, that'll be a great second part of this night when you when you'll hear more about agents, not not at our company, but just in general. But it's definitely something we're thinking about. But one of the guiding principles that 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 we have um, is the closer we are, the closer it is to making a decision, or the closer it is to an actual human being. If it's like a, an ad or something, we need to be extra skeptical of it. You know, when it came out, I I told my team treat this like a really really well educated intern. You know, no judgment, no experience. They don't know if it's right, if it's wrong but they went to a really good college, you know, and so they're going to probably be really useful and, and helpful, but not yet. You know, you're not going to just say, go do this. And they hand it to you and you say, okay, great. Here it is client. You know, like that's just not, not going to way the way things are going to be. So we're going to tiptoe into the world of agents. And, you know, one of the things that I think that the EU did well in terms of when they were thinking about legislation for, for AI was it is a risk-based model. And it's just, if we're talking about weapons, 
well, then we better have a, a whole lot more scrutiny on that. And the human in the loop should, there should be a machine in the loop, not a human in the loop, you know, like it should be the other way around. But if it's something that's not really impacting many people, then have at it. And I think agents will, will do a lot of interesting things um, in ways that are going to be really enriching in our lives. Um, some obvious and someone out there is building something right now that is going to revolution the, re revolutionize the way we do something. I don't know if I knew what it was, then I'd, you know, be the billionaire. All right, probably enough. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Let's. Uh, thank you, Jason. That was a, a great talk. Appreciate it. This is this is the second time I've heard that talk, and it's finally starting to sink in because I I actually have no ethics, business or otherwise. Um, so I'm I'm very glad I get to work with with Jason. We're going to take about a 10 minute break, um, get our get our next speaker up here, as Jason alluded, where um, she'll be talking a little bit about agentic design, et cetera, et cetera. So 10 minutes, introduce yourselves to your like these these guys here just shook hands. That's fantastic. I like to see that. Um, introduce yourselves to your 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 neighbors. If you don't know them, link in. Right. It's really easy to do these days. Talk to each other. If you need a biology break, just go down this hallway a little bit and look to your left. You'll find it. Come back in 10 minutes. So 7-11 by this by this clock here. And uh, we will we'll bring out a. a very different topic. Um, and thank you, Jason. We, we still have a little bit of food left. We got drinks and stuff like that. So knock yourselves out. But don't leave. Don't leave.
Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's time for the next speaker. It's time for the next speaker. Let's all settle in. I hope you all made a new friend. You all linked in with somebody. If you uh, if you if you exceeded expectations, you would have taken a selfie with your new friend and posted it out on LinkedIn or on on the socials or something like that. That's a little bit of foreshadowing because now we have um, security guards manning the elevators, and I kid you not, they're gonna want to look at your LinkedIn feed before they let you go down and prove that you actually you know, did something on LinkedIn about this event. I am not lying. I am 100% not lying about this. So yeah, what's my email again? BS at pmg.com. You know, I'm, I'm totally not lying. Um, but, you know, if you're so moved, you know, Post something out on 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 what your social media of choice. Tag PMG in there. Tag your friend. Take a, a selfie and say, "Hey, you know, I, I spent a Thursday afternoon at PMG." Um, our next speaker, uh, as the the last the most recent question we had was, is going to be talking a little bit about agentic design and how to apply LLMs to that. I've I've heard um, Akshita, I've known Akshita for, I don't know, a decade or so. I've heard her speak on a few occasions. I'm really looking forward to what she has to say because she usually, she always says it in a really good way. I'm personally very glad that Akshita is not a medical doctor because every time she gets up and talks, she kills it. Akshita? Hey everyone, um, I'm Akshita and I do machine learning at Cloudflare. In today's presentation, I'll be talking about AI agents, what they are, um, how you can use it to automate certain tasks and how you can take the capabilities of a large language model to the next level. Agents have been around for quite some time now. Um, it, you know, it, it, they're available in uh, robotics, autonomous cars, but in this presentation, I'll be mostly focusing on software agents related to large language models. So prior to um, large language models becoming popular, where if you were given a coding task, uh, what would you first do to solve that task? You would probably need to go figure out what the task is asking of you, do some online research, go look at the documentation of the language, that you're probably going to use, look at some APIs, write some pseudocode, you know, go to Stack Overflow, copy the code, test different approaches out. And as you can see, this is really time consuming. Once ChatGPT was released, all you had to do was ask ChatGPT, um, write some code to do this task, and then ChatGPT would provide you with a response. This has limitations though, because the code provided by ChatGPT may not be accurate on the first try. You would need to provide inputs back to the LLM saying, hey, make this change, or um, you know, this, I'm facing an error on this line of code. How, you know, could you suggest some ways of fixing it? So as you can see, there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of user input and babysitting that you need to do in this approach. And the other big limitation is that this is zero shot. So whatever code that you ask it to write, probably you, it, ChatGPT wouldn't have access to that info, um, to that domain knowledge un, unless it's been trained on it. So it goes and writes the code without any prior experience. But even then, it does, it still does a really good job as compared to the manual approach where you as a user had to go and do a lot of the research by yourself. So how can agents help here? Before I go further, um, we need to talk about what AI agents are. Anybody here wants to take a guess on what they are? And if you have any experiences using AI agents, then it would be great to hear your thoughts on how you're leveraging agents today. Any takers? Yeah. Yep. He says AI assistance, that's a good one. Any other takers? Uh, the service that uses multiple models, workflows, and um, 
hard coded prompts and service like uh, answers and frameworks to basically aid in a specific workflow. Yeah, be good. Any more? Um, probably GitHub Copilot. I don't really not a fan of it, but GitHub Copilot, I guess, would be one right that could be supposedly supposed to help you. It understands your code and it gives you certain su suggestions. Yeah, great point. Exactly. Nice. Um, I think it can. Uh, any agent can be considered as an AI agent um, if you're using AI assistance along with any other kind of tool, um, for instance, memory, uh, to elevate what it uh, the, to elevate the way it performs a task. Precisely. Uh, AI agents can do most tasks if the model's fine-tuned or trained on the functions that you're trying it to have it do. Cool. Yeah, you could think of it that way. Really good points, everyone. Keep it coming. Uh, applications that use LLMs for uh, inference and to give a specific response on a specific task. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I guess all of you were right in a way. Um, it's basically a software tool that you can leverage to autonomously perform a task based on some user inputs that you've previously configured it with. So they take the capabilities of a large language model to the next level. Taking that same coding example that we just discussed, um, if you were to use agents for that situation, you would have con you would you would probably use two agents. The first one being a coder agent that would write the code, and the second is a reviewing agent which reviews the code produced by the coder agent. So the way a workflow goes in this approach is the coder agent or the execution agent writes the code for that task, sends it to the reviewing agent. The reviewing agent finds some bugs and then sends it back to the uh, execution agent and asking it to fix that bug. And then the execution agent would fix that bug and send it back to the coder agent. The coder agent would see that there are some more bugs or maybe there's some tests are failing and sends it back to the execution agent and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of back and forth between these two agents trying to solve that one particular coding task. You could take that same example a little step further and then configure more agents to do the planning. So when you provided the coding task, you could have a planning agent which would take that task and then um, split the task into s smaller subtasks for uh, more instructions for another agent to do. You could also have a research agent configured which would do research on the problem statement at hand and then uh, go figure out some, you know, tools that it would need to use and come up with a solution. And then you have the execution agent that would actually build the solution and finally the review agent, which would critique the solution and then identify any bugs um, and send it back to the execution agent and that's a loop. So as you can see, your coding task is a lot simplified here as opposed to if you were to just ask an LLM to write the code for you because a lot of the planning, execution, uh, research, and the reviewing phase is done by agents as opposed to you as a human spending a lot of time on that same task and then going back and forth with the large language model or chat GPT. Here are some commonly used agentic design patterns. Agents are used for planning in the sense that they can take a very complex task that you provided and then split it into smaller and smaller subtasks, and therefore it generates a sequence of steps for another agent to execute. Or it could also be that the output of the planning agent goes into a large language model directly. So the large language model now has more context on the task at hand. It's also capable of reflection. Um, if you connect your agent to a vector database, it can store the memory and have the ability to correct its mistakes in the future. Um, and it can also make sure that it doesn't make those same mistakes again. 
Agents are also capable of leveraging tools to solve the task at hand. So for example, in the research agent that we discussed in a previous slide here, you could have the agent configured to do some online research on the task at hand and figure out which tool it needs to use. So agents have the ability to make the distinction between the different types of stools and which tool is appropriate for which um, situation. In the image here on the right, on the x-axis, we have human eval, which is a data set of hand curated 165 programming tasks. Um, so as you can see, they have applied agentic approaches on top of GPT-4 and GPT-3. And you can see that agentic approaches have beaten the zero shot, no agent, no prompting approach by a huge margin. And the last pattern is the collaboration. So you could have all of these different agents talk to each other. So let's take the same example of the coding task. If you're in an engineering team, you have different people performing different roles. So you have the developers building the code. You have the QA testers who are testing that code. Um, you have engineering managers who are making sure that the people are working as expected. You have product managers who are doing some research and planning. Similarly, you, you could configure all of these different agents to do different tasks of that particular um, yeah, you, you could configure all of these agents to do a different task and assign it different roles as you would for members of a team working together. I'll pause here for any questions. Uh, going back to your previous uh, slide, so all those other kind of approaches that are plotted here, those are different uh, like agents assigned to other you know, researchers or whatever is created. Is that right? Yeah. So the can you repeat the question? Yeah. So the question was on this image here towards the top left, or towards your top towards your right, are all of those different um, uh, approaches using agentic patterns? And the, the answer is yes. So the the zero shot in green at the uh, fifty. Uh, on, uh, at the number 50 on the x-axis is the no agentic approach. And people have used different agentic approaches like um, reflection agents, multi-agent collaboration agents, uh, execution agent, agents with tools. And any agent approach uh, combined on top of a large language model has shown to give much better results than um, single shot, single request, large language, uh, single than a single request to a large language model. Cool. So coming to the examples of where agents are being used today, somebody uh, in the when I asked previously, what have you used agents for? Someone mentioned GitHub Copilot. That's a good example. You also have another example like CodeDroid, which is a software agent tool that's capable of writing autonomous, rote, tedious programming tasks as per their website. And these agents are capable of planning, tooling, understanding, and sampling from different approaches. In addition to this, I'm sure you all have probably heard about Devin, the first software AI agent when it got released. Um, so Devin is capable of rewinding and editing its mistakes and coming up with better solutions. Here's a, an image taken from SWE Bench, which has the leaderboard of different um, approaches to solving uh, different programming tasks on GitHub. So the percentage resolved metric is a percentage of GitHub issues resolved. As you can see here, Agentic approaches like Factory Code Droid, Auto Code Revo Rover has performed better than any approaches uh, with RAG, or with RAG plus large language models. So when I say agentic approaches, I don't I mean agent plus LLM. So agent plus LLM has performed better than RAG plus LLM or just LLM.
So now that we know what agents are capable of, what are some ways in which we can um, use AI agents to build our own autonomous tasks? You can use something called Crew AI, which I've explored previously and which I'll be showing in the demo here. It's basically a low-code tool where you can orchestrate different role-playing autonomous agents for completing a certain task. And these agents are also capable of interacting with each other, revising, editing. Some other approaches are AutoGPT, GPT agents, LangGraph, which is another popular LangChain-based framework. So in conclusion, are more agents all you need? Uh, this is actually a research paper where Researchers have evaluated agentic approaches plus LLMs versus just plus single call LLMs. And they found that agents plus LLMs have performed better than a single LLM call on all the tasks that it was evaluated on. Just like we saw in the SWE bench leaderboard. Um, agents can also imp greatly improve your productivity because if Again, going back to that same coding task, you are taking away a lot of the time in reviewing the code and making sure that it's accurate, making sure it's, it's error-free and syntax error-free and so on. If you could have agents do that for you, you could spend that time doing something else. So therefore, you could get, have huge gains in productivity using agents. Um, another thing to note is that agents are not good at all kinds of tasks, as we'll see in later in the limitations section. But they're mostly good for low risk, um, significant time consumption tasks where you have repetitive things that you need to do over and over and over again. Um, and it, it, they do really well if you need to have some you know, low input, low human input tasks. Otherwise, it's just going to be like your normal um, AI workflow without agents. So, but you, you probably don't want to use agents all the time because the first big limitations that I've found is that agents take a really long time to process certain tasks. Um, and they're more expensive because you need to make multiple LLM calls and you're also having the issue of uh, dealing with larger prompts. So you would probably need to have access to a, a large language model that's capable of handling all of these uh, larger prompts. Additionally, there are energy consideration, con uh, energy consumption constraints. As you saw in Jason's presentation, a single uh, call to ChatGPT takes about 2.9 megawatts per hour. Um, and obviously, with agents, you would probably deal with double that consumption. You also need to figure out when and what agent you need to use. You can't use agents, you can't use a research agent to write code and vice versa. And it's very important that when you're building your agent, you build it accurately with the right set of goals and um, descriptions so that the agent knows what it's doing. I've also found that if you configure an agent that is doing more than one task, it's probably not going to do it as well. So make sure that when you're configuring the agent, it it has it it does only one. It it knows that it needs to do only one task. Unfortunately, the other big issue with agentic approaches is that debugging errors is really time consuming. So um, if if you have built a very complex system that makes use of multiple agents interacting with each other, what happens is that your final output, if it's not up to the quality standards, and if there's a lot of hallucinations or incorrect output, or you know some sort of a harmful content, you would need to go back and trace where exactly the output, which which LLM or which agent gave the wrong output. So you would need to go and make sure you tweak the prompt to make it more more um, higher quality and less error prone. And unfortunately, it still needs a human in the loop. The output of the agent, you can't blindly trust it. You would still need to do some um, human evaluations and make sure that there's minimal hallucinations, the output quality is good, and of course, there's a lot of ethical constraints with uh, 
the LLM providing harmful content. Another funny um, limitations of agents are that it still needs a manager or a CEO agent role that oversees the task because a lot of the times agents, some of these agents just don't do their job. They just don't make any contributions. So you need a manager or CEO role that makes sure that the agent is providing the output that uh, is required. There's also the situation where agents are stuck in an infinite recursive loop. So you would still need to manually go and fix those issues. Here's a quick demo. Um, I built a very simple application using FastAPI and used React for the front end to showcase the capabilities of agents. I've already run this code. It's a very simple um, application where I have a list of companies that I am interested to invest in or buy some shares. And I would uh, select that company here and do research. And when I click that button, uh, in the back end, agents are going to do, the, uh, do some um, job for me and then provide the results of whether I should, I, I, I should invest in that um, business or not. Since it takes a long time, I have not, um, I'm not doing the demo live, but you are more than welcome to go to the QR code and look at the GitHub code. I've included all of the information that you need to run the code on your local laptops. Here's the UI. I wasn't sure if I could switch screen, so I copy pasted the screenshot. Here's what the agent output looks like in the backend. Um, so the first agent that I configured, let's go with those first. The first agent that I configured and which is relevant to the stock is the research agent. So I've used crew AI here and the role I provided this crew AI agent is that of a research agent. And the goal I've specified is that it needs to go and gather all the latest financial news about the company. And the backstory is another key piece of information here. Um, you need to provide some additional context or prompt so that the agent has information on what it's good at and what it's not. And the tool I've used is a DuckDuckGo search tool from Langchain. Um, it's a wrapper on the DuckDuckGo search API. Um, and then the output, the output of this research agent is a series of articles based on the company uh, that you are interested to know about. And that output is going to another agent called the summarizer agent, which I've configured here as the role of summarizer agent. And its goal is to generate key points about the research. And again, provide it a backstory by saying that it's great at providing expert summaries and ge generating comprehensive um, notes. The large language model I've used here is an Olama model, a locally hosted Llama 3, 7 billion model. And finally, the recommender agent is the last agent that I configured to say, take the summary of the summary agent and make a recommendation as to whether I need to invest in this company or not. And the LLM used is Olama model. So as you can see here, I'm making two um, LLM calls. The first one in the summary agent and the second in the recommender agent. I've also leveraged a tool, which is a search tool. Obviously you could go and use any other tool out there. There are so many um, tools that you could use to do online research. And finally, going back into the agent output, you will see that once the first research agent is uh, completed, it provides a list of all of the financial news related results. And that output is gonna go into the summary agent, which provides a, which, which uses that as context and then generates a summary in bullet points. And the next one is going to be the recommender agent, which takes the output of the summary agent and then makes a recommendation of whether it's worth investing in Netflix. Yep, 
that's all from me, folks. Any questions? Uh, on the 1st of July of this month, uh, the Asian Less paper was published in Archive, Archive, or Archive, I don't know how it's pronounced, <clears throat> which precisely was, was criticizing all these Devin, StepChat, Langchain, saying, look, we can get the same performance with a much simpler architecture. So all what you're doing just as marketing to sell, we can do the same with much less. So the question that I have for you is that we can do the same with much less because this is the state of the art of, of, of today. But if you want to reach farther, you need that kind of architecture or no. And it, this is, I mean, as far as we can get, we can get it with much simpler architectures, not with such complicated debins and, 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 and alike. So the question is that, can we reach farther with what Asian is proposing or not to reach farther with we need debins and we need long chains? I think that's a great question. So your question to rephrase it is, could we uh, go further with less or do we have to leverage agents to um, scale up and do better? Is that correct? I mean, I guess it depends on the task at hand. Um, if you if you have a real, if you have access to a really powerful LLM, then you probably don't need an agentic approach for this coding task um, because that LLM is going to give you a really good output in the first shot itself. Um, but I guess it depends on your resources, any constraints you have, and also on the task you have at hand. You probably don't need to use agentic approaches for really simple tasks. But if it's something complex, like generating emails with um, low risk of you know, errors, or you're OK with false positives or false negatives, then I would say, and it's a very tedious task, then I would say agentic approaches work well. Um, so I noticed you used Olama. Um, why was that your, what's the reasoning behind using that one? Because I, I, I tried, and maybe you can help me out here, but um, I was running Olama on my own devices and uh, maybe because I used a highly quantized model, I wasn't able to get good performance. So if it's the cost, like if it, if the issue is the cost of using like open API keys, uh, there's also Gemini. So what was the reasoning behind using Olama over other freely available LLMs? Yeah, that's a great question. So I built this um, demo just for the purposes of this presentation. Um, and Olama is convenient uh, to use. So I figured, you know, everybody has, uh, you don't need an API key to use Olama. So I figured it's easy for people to get started if they wanted to try this code out. Thanks. Uh, first of all, awesome presentation. Appreciate it. Um, had a question on the architecture side where um, you mentioned debugging, right? So you've got this chain of events. So it's debugging's hard because it's where did that go wrong? Um, but then also, you know, how do you handle error validation or, you know, you know, validating the output and then validating the input? Is there, you know, do you put agents in between or curious if you have thoughts on that? Yeah, you could put agents in between um, where, you configure the agent to you know, fix bugs or see if there's any errors based on uh, whatever you're asking it to do. But ultimately, with agentic approaches, you could run it hierarchically or you could run it in parallel sequentially. Um, so yeah, you would, and if you wanted to automate away a lot of your um, reviewing stuff, if you didn't want to have a lot of human input, then you would insert an agent in between and then say, take the output of this particular agent, review it, and make sure that it's error-free. But you would need to specify really clearly in the goal and description what exactly it needs to do um, so that it does the job well. Since this is a just a demo example, I didn't specify much instructions, but you would need to specify a lot of the information and the backstory in the goal. 
one comment and then a question. A, a gentleman was asking about like, can you go easier? So I have two teams, one that does custom code where they're just chaining things together. Another one uses LangGraph. And the thing that I think you're bringing up on like traceability, observability, LangGraph and other frameworks just take care of a lot of that for you. And every time somebody starts on custom build, it is really hard to go to production. So there's this challenge you run into from, yes, it'll work, but man, it's a pain to trace anything and put in the observability and your test cases. Yeah. So that said, you mentioned um, crew, autogen, and um, LangGraph. Like, what's your preference between them? Like. You seem to have tried a few of them. Just get your thoughts. Everybody I talk to has different opinions. Honestly, I've just tried Crew AI. <laughs> I haven't explored other approaches, but um, the thing I like about Crew AI is it in, it's intuitive in the sense that you know what exactly is going in, where there are specified specific fields for the goal of the agent, the goal and backstory. So. Yeah, that's just my preference. I unfortunately I haven't tried other frameworks to give a better answer. So how is this different from something like chain of thought prompting, which instead of having multiple LLMs, you just use a single LLM that evaluates itself? I think that's a good question. With agentic approaches, you also have agents that you could configure them to make sure that the output is um you know, the output of one agent is being reviewed by the other. And the second thing is that agents have the intelligence to to decide which tool to use. Um, and they are able to make that distinction as to when they need to use which tool for the task at hand. We'll, we'll have a graph of thought presentation in a month or two right here in this room. That's a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, and And there's great contrasts and complementary aspects to agentic design and chain of thought. We've got a question right here. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, this is a really impressive demo. Um, I have some questions about it. Is uh, So first of all, for the summary agent, I see there's no tools as input into that agent. Like, what's the main difference of that agent from just a normal LLM? Is it you just give some context of the prompt? Yeah, exactly. Um, I have not used any tool here for the summary agent because it wasn't necessary. I've just used the LLM, mm -hmm. which is the Ola locally hosted Olama model. But for the research agent, I've specified the tool that it could it needs to use, which is the DuckDuckGo search tool from LangChain. Okay. Uh, and the uh, question is, uh, uh, like, because this workflow of research and summary and recommendation, like, who is uh, breaking down the task into those steps? Is it uh, you have a planning agent, as you mentioned, uh, not showing in the slides here? Like, No, I don't have a planning agent. I broke it down um, into these three agents. But you could have a planning agent to say that, uh, you know, given the task at hand, I mean, this is a very simple example because I just specified the business that it needs to go do re financial research on. Um, but you could have a planning agent for a more complex task to say, take that, take the task, break it down into smaller subtasks and generate a sequence of steps. And so your output from that agent would be a bunch of sequences and steps that other agents would consume off of. Got it. So in this demo, is it just LLM itself with, uh, figure out the steps as um, like how which agent should run first and then second? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have specified that in my code. Are you able to see the... So I've, I've specified in my code what's the sequence of steps that the agents should run in. So the first agent would be the research agent. And then the second agent would be a summarizer agent. And finally, the recommender agent. So they're running sequentially. Gotcha. OK, so it's still defined as hard-coded logic. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate it.
I think we had a question here, sir. Is that right? Well, okay, sure. Uh, this kind of reminds me of like Kubernetes, you know, like everyone says you don't really need Kubernetes, like, like for your, you know, for small apps. My, it's just kind of like a thought, you can take it as a question maybe, but like, I was just wondering how scalable is this? Cause like, for instance, you have this demo right now and it seems like, you know, it was going to take a while to run. So like, what are some aspects that you would improve? Would you like develop your own transformer, you know, like or would you depend on a company to build it for you or to have that model ready for you? What, what steps would you take on that? Yeah, um, I think the biggest bottleneck is in the LLM calls. Here I'm using a locally hosted Olama model. Obviously, if you wanted more scalable and faster, you would use a much larger model. Um, but... I, and also, if you are expecting results in real time, I don't think agents are a good idea. Um, something that's more batch and you're okay with low latency, then I would say agents are a good idea. We'll have, I guess, two more questions We're here and then up front. Um, and then just so we cycle it, we'll have, you know, We'll keep the doors open um, till about 8.30 or so. I think both speakers are still here. Uh, there's a few PMG are still here. There's a lot of really cool people in the room too. So we'll have about 45 minutes, 40 minutes or so for, for further discussion, but, but two more formal questions. Um, I didn't really have a question. I was eager to share um, something that could help debugging. Um, and um, essentially Langchain has like a thought action observation, which is called React. Uh, which um, essentially directs your LLM to, uh, while it's generating its response, also keep a log of how what it thought about, about the task, about the information that it has, the action that it took, uh, and an observation about uh, how it thinks it's performing. And it helps in two ways. One, it helps for manual debugging. That means you, don't, you, you, you can choose whether or not you want to have like an administrator LLM. Or even if you have an administrator LLM, it is easier for that LLM to analyze the, the responses and figure out what's going wrong. That was that was fantastic. That's that's like a community helping out a community. This is this is great. I'm just I'm I'm in tears right now. I'm just so happy. I'm just so happy. I think I think you had the last one. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> you showed kind of the table there, and you mentioned that. Uh, agent-based approaches outperforming like LLMs plus brag. Have you seen anyone uh, trying to even combine those three techniques? Uh, retrieval, you know, retrieval augmented generation in your in the context of your agent and then talking to other agents? Yeah, I'm sure there have there are people that have tried it, but I don't have any examples of um, online research, but I would assume that that's a really good approach to um, deal with you know, no domain knowledge or zero context with the RAG, and then you have agents that are self-correcting and reflective. Okay, on that last question, again, in about a month, oh, one more, oh, one one quick. Okay, here we go. Just to say, there was just a published paper on Open Devon that just came out on archive. So it has some of the kind of answers to the kind of question you're asking about how the how these things are actually built for the software agent. That's fantastic. That's fa Sorry, someone had asked about how these agents are uh, configured and how they run. So I, like I said, they're sequentially running off one after the other, and I specified them in the, um, in the crew. So first you have the research agent, then the summary agent, and then the recommender agent assigned at certain tasks. And then I'm telling the crew that they have to run the tasks sequentially. But I have specified the code in this QR code. So if you're interested, feel free to check it out. It's a very simple um, agentic demo. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And I also want to say that Cloudflare, the company that I work at, is hiring. We're hiring for a variety of data science, machine learning, and data analyst roles. If you're interested, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to talk more, but some of the work we do is um, in related to Gen AI and this meetup is we're trying to, uh, we, we are generating emails or, uh, using generative AI. 
Um, so if that's interesting to you, then feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Akshita. That was a that was a fantastic um, uh, presentation. The uh, um, Cloudflare is hiring. PMG is hiring. The choice you all have to make now is: Do you want to work with Akshita or do you want to work with me? <sighs> yeah. As I was walking around, my my step counter, you know, hit my daily goal. So I'm I'm pretty happy right now. Yay. Um, we are going to, you know, the, the speakers are here. Jason's over there, Akshita's there. If you are a PMG employee and want to out yourself as a PMG employee, can you please raise your hand? So if you're curious about what we do here in this building, please come and talk to one of us. Um, and if not, that's fine too. We're going to keep the doors open until about 8.30 or so, and then we'll start, you know, giving you the bums rush out. Um, thank you for coming. I ask a couple of things before you before you go one you know take a selfie with a friend uh put it out on whatever your social media is of choice because hey it's a network we're trying to you know we're trying to generate some buzz here please do that but then also come back right well there's there's another also after that come back right come back and bring a friend because you know where you are trying to build a community we are trying to you know have some really interesting content um as we move forward and kind of build ourselves build Austin as a place of sharing some ideas. Speaking of sharing ideas, this is the also also. If you want to tell a story, here's a spot for you right here, literally right where I'm standing. Please come back. You've got an interesting story to tell. I guarantee it. Come back, contact one of the PMGers, and we will we will work to get you up here um, and go from there. So thank you all. I think we're almost out of food. We probably still got a little bit of wine left, but we still have a great group of people to, to talk to. So have have at it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.